I rewatched the entire Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy, and I just don't think it gets the respect it deserves. Sure, Curse of the Black Pearl was received positively, but I still think that its true greatness was overlooked. And the same goes for its two sequels. So let's talk the overlooked brilliance of the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy. Captain Jack Sparrow receives one of the greatest character introductions I've ever seen. He's presented as your typical hero, staring into the horizon as the heroic musical score swells. Despite his confidence, he's in big trouble, as he typically is. His boat's sinking fast. What's so great about this intro is how we learn everything we need to know about Jack's personality. For one, he sees himself as an infamous pirate despite his unfortunate circumstances. He has a sense of a moral compass, as we can see when he pays respect to his fallen pirate. Pirates. And third, even though he's in trouble, he always finds a way to get out of it as if he was in control the whole time. And to cap it all off, Hans Zimmer's heroic theme continues as his ship sinks into the harbor. While the other two main characters, Will and Elizabeth, aren't cinematic icons, they are good characters that service the adventure story. Without them to ground the movie, we would only have Jack chasing his ship, and not really changing much as a character. He's the source of comedy and chaos, so they're more directly relatable to the audience. And they're introductions are just as effective as Jack's. We see Elizabeth is constrained by the expectations placed on her. Her dress literally symbolizes that by making it difficult for her to breathe. I'm told it's the latest fashion in London. Well, women in London must have learned not to breathe. As for Will, we see that he's out of his element when he breaks the candle and tries to hide it, and we also quickly find out that he's a blacksmith and that he's outlandishly in love with Elizabeth. In order to create characters that stick with the audience, they need to feel real. To feel real, we need to be given information about the characters that isn't delivered with boring exposition. In other words, they need to speak like real human beings. A perfect example of this is the duel between Will and Jack. Jack breaks the rules constantly throughout the fight. Stepping on a board to use it as a weapon, constantly changing his fighting stance. He does these things because he knows that he can't beat Will on swordsmanship alone. We learn in the fight that Will spends hours every day practicing. And I practice with them three hours a day. We also learn that Jack is saving a bullet for someone other than Will. This really helps the characters feel real because this information comes up naturally in the fight. And as a side note, I love the creativity in this action sequence. Introducing a superheated sword and making them balance on a wagon, even fighting in the rafters, all that adds extra stakes to what would normally be a run-of-the-mill duel. And when those creative action ideas are combined with witty dialogue, you have yourself a perfect action sequence. And without a doubt, Curse of the Black Pearl has some of the most witty dialogue in the entire trilogy. Me, I'm dishonest. And a dishonest man you can always trust to be dishonest. Honestly. Unlike the sequels to this trilogy, Captain Jack actually seems like he has some semblance of intelligence, instead of seeming like a character out of a comedy sketch. And that's absolutely essential for his character. We have to consistently ask ourselves this question. You think he plans it all out? just makes it up as he goes along. All that said, the perfect pirate story also requires the perfect pirate villain. You know, I think it was Martin Scorsese that said that, actually. <laughs> Seriously though, Barbosa was a way better villain than I expected on rewatch. For Barbosa, they took the cheesy pirate stereotype and actually made it work. I especially love these scenes that lead up to the big reveal that he is an undead pirate skeleton man. He gives Elizabeth all this food and you're kind of thinking that maybe he poisoned it or something, but it's soon revealed that he creepily is enjoying watching her eat, especially the apples. Even the monkey's enjoying it. Creepy monkey. There's a slow burn buildup as he describes the curse that they've been under, and Jeffrey Rush just chews up every single line of dialogue. You can really tell that he was enjoying this role. One of 882 identical pieces they delivered in a stone chest to Cortez himself. Arr! And just when you think the movie's gone off the rails into goofiness, Barbosa gives this creepy monologue again. You best start believing in ghost stories, Miss Turner. You're in one. <laughs> there are so many classic lines in this movie. I love it. This first entry also does an incredible job at creating the Pirates of the Caribbean world. The ships are actual replicas in the water. That makes everything feel so much more real than if everything were just sets and green screens the entire time. The same goes for filming in actual Caribbean locations. Just look at the vibrant blues and whites. It adds so much to the movie's color palette. That's really welcome as many current 
current blockbusters look gray and bland. On the flip side, the CGI holds up really well, especially on Barbosa's crew. Their movements are limited, kind of stiff and awkward, but that complements the fact that they are supposed to be skeletons. And there are some incredible shots and cinematography here as well. Gore Verbinski and the cinematographer, however you say his name, just did fantastic work on this movie. These shots aren't just colorful, they're creative. Pirates of the Caribbean Curse of the Black Pearl holds up as one of the greatest adventure films of all time. It introduced one of the most iconic characters ever in Captain Jack Sparrow, and actually uses quality filmmaking techniques to tell an amazing adventure story. Drink up me hearty Joho. Also, there's a monkey that turns into a zombie in the post credits scene, so this is automatically a cinematic masterpiece. All that said, I pretty much knew that I would enjoy Curse of the Black Pearl on rewatch. What I was uncertain about were the two sequels in the trilogy, especially given their Rotten Tomatoes scores. But like Curse of the Black Pearl, Dead Man's Chest is one of the best examples of a blockbuster focusing in on its characters rather than just simply the plot. All without losing the core elements that made everyone like the characters in the first place. I got a jar of dirt. I got a jar of dirt. And guess what's inside it? The first movie had everyone searching for freedom in some way. Will wanted the freedom to be with Elizabeth. Elizabeth wanted the freedom to make her own decisions. And Jack wanted the Black Pearl. What the Black Pearl really is is freedom. But in Dead Man's Chest, they lose it all because of consequences from the past. For Will and Elizabeth, it was helping Jack in the first movie. Lord Beckett essentially cancels their wedding and tasks Will with tracking down Jack. And Jack himself is facing the past because we find out that he has a black spot on his hand from a deal he made with someone called Davy Jones, all to ensure that he could remain captain of the Black Pearl for 13 years. Davy Jones is the reckoning for everyone escaping their past. You cross Davy Jones and boom, he's there. He is a brutal character. Do you feel dead? He's the perfect villain to embody the past catching up to the main characters. Ironically, he hasn't even moved on from the past himself. While he is an incredibly evil and inhuman villain, he has a very human backstory. He was once a man who fell in love with the sea goddess Calypso. When she left him, his pain became so unbearable that he cut out his own heart to live an immortal life on the sea, torturing people just so they could feel the pain he did. What makes him so interesting is that there is a small part Part of him that is still human, instead of just a squid man. He is still sentimental enough to listen to Calypso's musical locket. I could go on for another hour about one villainous scene with Davy Jones, but let's just say that's been done. Like the first movie, the action in Dead Man's Chest, mwah, masterpiece. <laughs> Seriously though, the action in this movie is some of the most creative. What I love about these scenes is that it's not just a bunch of CGI thrown in your face. Most of these scenes are using practical effects. Well, aside from the crack in action sequence. But to be honest, even that CGI holds up for the most part. Plus seeing a kraken on screen is just cool, right? And these action scenes find a way to both make it suspenseful and comedic. And the comedy doesn't always come from a random joke. It comes from dreaming up extravagant, ridiculous action sequences like this one with Jack running on the beach. The same goes for the duel between Jack, Will, and Norrington. They all convene to try to get Davy Jones' chest. You could always just have a simple action sequence about fighting, crossing swords, with the major suspense being who will live and who will die. But what makes the action here so different is that there's an external element to the fight. They're all trying to get control of the key to the chest. And that opens the door for these creative stunts, with each character swapping control of the key. There are so many layers and moving parts to the action sequences in this movie. But of course, like all movies shot back to back, this one ends with a forced cliffhanger. Elizabeth chains Jack to the Black Pearl, because she knows that the Kraken's after him alone. So it appears that Jack is just straight up dead, right? But apparently, death means nothing, and Barbosa's back from the dead. Sure, it's forced, but at least Barbosa gets that 
apple he was always talking about. Despite his somewhat over-convoluted plot, and a kind of weird enforced love triangle, Dead Man's Chest does exactly what it needed to do as a sequel, stay true to its characters, while also introducing a new plot that can carry the franchise. And with the introduction of Davy Jones and some of the most creative action sequences I've ever seen in a blockbuster, Dead Man's Chest earns its place as one of the greatest blockbusters ever made. And then we get the final chapter in the trilogy, At World's End. And it's incredibly weird and messy. And I still think it's it's great, but I do get the criticisms. Information is thrown at us from nowhere. Jack is a pirate lord now? A kraken died between movies? Barbosa, who just came back from the dead, wants to free Davy Jones's ex-girlfriend that also happens to be a vengeful sea goddess? It feels rushed because it is. They needed to write and film it back to back with Dead Man's Chest. But despite all those issues, this movie finds a pocket of weirdness and extravagance that elevates its creativity above most modern blockbusters. As the scholars might say, this movie goes hard. The opening scene is chilling. It depicts a crowd of people who have been sentenced to hang for associating with pirates. A child's even amongst them. Now you'd probably assume that the heroes would jump in and save these people. They don't. And it's such a gutsy move for the filmmakers to go for this in a Disney movie. Director Gore Verbinski really had a lot of creative freedom for this movie. The cinematography and art design alone rival modern blockbusters. We get so many magnificent wide shots. Towering icebergs, haunting ships shrouded in darkness on the horizon, sunsets bursting with color, this shot of the night sky mirrored in the water. The sheer amount of color and creativity they fit into these shots is just amazing. While this movie has some of the most amazing looking shots of the entire trilogy, it also has some of the weirdest looking shots. While some might see Captain Jack's nose sniffing a peanut and think this is the stupidest thing they've ever seen in their life, I see a radical and experimental filmmaking approach. Jack's nose is filmed in a way that simulates a ship moving across the sea. That's probably the goofiest, most pretentious thing I've ever said. But I stand by it, damn it! You've lost your mind! You've lost your goddamn mind! As offbeat as these scenes are in this purgatory-type world, I can't help but be entranced by it every time I see it. Multiple versions of Jack interact with each other aboard the Black Pearl, and we're never really sure which one is the real one. In a way, that perfectly represents Jack's chaotic personality. We also get this stark, white void, filled with thousands of little crabs. It's absolutely surreal. As a kid, I really hated these scenes, but today I have a new respect for seeing this experimental filmmaking in a blockbuster. Or maybe I'm just weirder. Either way, the weirdness leads to one of Captain Jack's best introductions in any of these movies. The crabs literally drive the Black Pearl over the sand dunes and back into the sea. That level of spectacle is present in every action sequence in the movie. Just look at these action sequences. There's an incredibly well choreographed action scene in Singapore that ends with a monkey setting off explosives. There's a scene where Jack uses a cannon to launch himself from ship to ship. You're mad. Thank goodness for that, because if I wasn't, this would probably never work. And of course the finale, where two ships clash in the middle of a whirlwind created by a sea goddess. What's most impressive about this trilogy is how it blends CGI with practical effects. For example, Davy Jones and his crew are almost entirely CGI, but the ships they sail are actual replicas. Using practical effects helps add a bit of realism to this fantasy world filled with cursed pirates and sea monsters. Where this movie really shines is the grand finale. The standout is this outlandish wedding ceremony for Will and Elizabeth. Barbosa reluctantly agrees to marry them amongst a battle with the undead crew. It's unrealistic, but the filmmakers commit to its extravagance. And with intricate fight choreography with the waves crashing upon them, this scene serves as a perfect payoff to their romance. Will was a bit lost until this point in the movie. He wasn't really sure if Elizabeth was actually in love with Jack. His detachment is probably a factor in Orlando Bloom being nominated for a Razzie Award. It's certainly not his best performance, but a Razzie Award? I just don't think so. As for Elizabeth, it's just a great character arc to have her start as a damsel in distress and end up king of the pirates. In the first movie, she didn't really have the skills to challenge the pirates, but she was smart enough to burn the rum to serve as a beacon on that island. But why is the rum gone? 
But by the time we get to this movie, she has the exaggerated supply of pirate weaponry. I just always appreciate seeing that kind of transformation in character arcs. As for Jack, he stays true to the chaos and humor that made his character so iconic. Like the other main characters, Jack has something to sacrifice. He gives up his dream of immortality sailing the seas in order to save Will when he's stabbed through the heart. Just like Will and Elizabeth sacrifice their life together, which ultimately leads to a really gutsy ending. Will and Elizabeth are separated. Elizabeth takes care of their child while Will is forced to sail the seas on the Flying Dutchman to serve as a gatekeeper for the dead. And he's only able to come ashore once every 10 years. Unlike most Chosen One storylines, this one is really bittersweet. Meanwhile, Jack's left without the Black Pearl, plotting to take it back from Barbosa. There's almost something poetic about having Jack and his storyline in the exact same place he started in. It's the perfect ending to reflect this enduring legend of Captain Jack Sparrow. And that's the secret brilliance behind the Pirates trilogy. It knew how to create the perfect adventure for its characters. And despite the convoluted plot choices, when you have Johnny Depp's iconic performance as Captain Jack, CGI that rivals technology today, and some of the most creative action sequences of all time, you get one of the best trilogies ever created. If you enjoyed, make sure to like the video so more people can see it and hopefully give this amazing trilogy another chance. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bring me that horizon.